I'm Sue Gong from Berthon, and uh, we're just going to have a chat on Skype now and do another short uh, podcast with uh, Steve Dashu um, of uh, Dashu Offshore, uh, now retired but still very much uh, a keen observer and uh, still mentoring and doing quite a lot in the uh, yacht design business and thank goodness for it. Okay, so Steve, we haven't done one of these podcasts for a little while, and um, although we talk all the time, we thought it'd be just fun to do that. So now that you're not doing yacht designing and uh, delivering uh, FPBs 24-7, what are you and Linda getting up to these days? Oh, we've been, I think we're busier in retirement than we were uh, when we were working full-time. Um, we've uh, been spending quite a bit of time uh, on our photography, which uh, we are, we've never had time in the past to pursue as much as we would like to. Uh, doing a little consulting, uh, and we've been uh, in the pandemic to keep ourselves from going crazy. Uh, we've taken a, a, a Ford truck and put a camper on it and, and totally redone the camper with uh, yacht, tile, yacht style systems. Uh, and then... A land yacht. A land yacht for sure. <laughs> and so Linda, Linda decided that that uh, the interior aesthetics were lacking, so we ended up putting a whole new interior in it. Yeah, yeah, and it's got a rib as well that it goes behind it. Yeah, we, uh, uh, we decided we had to have a boat of some sort, so we have a um, six and a half uh, meter uh, Zodiac rib. Perfect, fantastic. And one of the things that we notice, and you and I have chatted about, is that uh, since uh, we stopped uh, accepting orders for FPBs, there have been certainly a growth, exponential growth in uh, the Explorer yacht market. And there does seem to be quite a lot of bare metal that looks a bit like an FPB about. Um, and uh, so you've, you've looked at that too? Uh, yeah, we've been, of course, keeping our eye on uh, what's uh, going on in the marketplace. And I have to say we're flattered by people trying to imitate what we've done in the past. When we were working together, um, it was always clear to me that you guys came from a different angle. It wasn't in about sitting in front of a computer screen. It wasn't so much about looking at uh, dynamics and mathematics. It was more about real life experience and building it and cruising it and all that kind of stuff. Can you just go through that a little bit for me? Just unwrap that a bit. I think the easiest way to answer that is to say that, that uh, at the end, uh, yachts, yacht design is a zero-sum game, and anything you do within the, within the envelope that uh, constitutes the design uh, affects everything else. And the way you make those decisions uh, is, is a critical uh, uh, part of this equation. Um, and uh, everybody makes those decisions based on their training and their experience. Our, our approach has, has been different than anyone else's because we are, we are uh, cruisers first and uh, yacht designers second, and we've always been trying to fulfill the goal of a perfect yacht. And in our case, uh, because we like to travel, we, we love the high latitudes, uh, but we don't like to pay comfort or, or be worried about security penalties. So everything we do in the yachts is, uh, reflects that, and uh, which ends up, you, you, you have trade-offs that are quite different than a than, uh, more conventional approach. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, when you're building something, you know, an explorer yacht, I mean, if you go and you buy a production boat, it is what it is, and there's a spec, and there are spec choices and bish bosh. When you're building something like an FPB, like, you know, something that's going to go to the Antarctic, have real capability and all that kind of stuff, um, it's quite a big deal. So how, if you were going to, if, if you were going somewhere where they were offering you an Explorer yacht and, and that sort of deal, how would you go about evaluating the right design package? You know, that you're starting from the right, the right hull shape, the right design from which you can build that boat? That's a really difficult question, Sue, for us to answer. Uh, we've uh, had the benefit of all the modern tools, uh, the CFD, we were, probably uh, one of the first or second people to, to use velocity prediction many years ago when it was brand new. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the, it's the real world experience that, that we have to make the decisions on. 
no matter what the computing power, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you what happens in rough water. It doesn't tell you what it feels like after you've been going to windward for three or four days in a, into a crossing head seat and have three or four more days to go and, and uh, what you feel like when you're on that passage. Um, that's, what, that's what focuses our design. Um, and uh, I, I, we don't have the time or we don't really want to get into the details of what other people are doing. What we can tell other people is just look at the boats carefully. Uh, look at the people behind them. Uh, it, be sure that you, if you're, if you're, if any boat that you that you're going to go seriously cruising on, you want to be out in gale force conditions, uh, and it's a huge investment of your time and, and money, plus security. And uh, we would just, we just highly recommend that you go to sea in some adverse conditions. Uh, if the, if nobody wants to go out with you, that's the day to go out. Sea trial. This is a pretty good sea trial. Yeah. The broker doesn't want to take you out. Um, those are the conditions you really want to test the boat in, and then you'll know. That's something you said that's really interesting, actually, because it's a lot of people they talk about whether the boat will take the seas and and whether she's safe and all the rest of it, but you're talking about how the crew, how the guys on the boat, are feeling when they're in those conditions, and that's actually just as important if not more isn't it There's no point having something that will take the punishment if she kills her crew while she's doing it so you hit the nail on the head there the the real answer to successful cruising is being comfortable mentally and physically you don't really know what that is until you're 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 trying to get through standing waves upwind or downwind or, or you have a crossing head seat uh, where there's no speed that, that, that you can that you can no, no speed or angle which is comfortable and as you get tired on these longer passages, the, the, the acceleration of the boat, the sea state, where you live, how difficult it is to move around the boat, these all come into play with, with what you're feeling. And it's, it's a, uh, when, you're, when you're tired and, uh, and there's a little bit of extra motion, everything, uh, it's like a snowball effect and it, it gets, worse, uh, gets worse very quickly mentally. And, and so the, the, uh, the ability to, to, to rest uh, the the mental to have the ability to have mental security that you know that you can outrun the weather conditions that you can maintain your high average speeds that your systems are are secure and but accessible if you need to get to them that's all part of the package and when you when you take all those pieces and put them together and now you're at sea as it's, it's a husband and wife shorthanded etc um, uh, the way that those pieces go together and the way the way that you're experiencing those long passages. If you're comfortable, then you then it's like okay, let's go. No, no worries. It's just 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 a couple thousand miles here or there. If you're not comfortable, then you're looking for excuses. Uh, and I, you know, Sue, that our that our sailboats and our and our power boats all have a huge mileage on them. They don't sit at the docks. People that buy those boats, uh, new and used, are not are are looking for boats to to, to go places on. And the reason they go places on it because the trade-offs we make are all oriented towards seagoing comfort and security and average boat speed. Now, it's a zero-sum game, so when you do that, you give up a little interior space, which you have to make up for with, with a little bit longer water line. But at the end of the day, if you want to go places, you, there's really no other way to do it. You have to, uh, you have to have steering control. You have to have the ability at least to maintain these high average speeds because that's how you make the weather work for you. Uh, and you have to have a, 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 a hull shape, which above all is comfortable uh, in all sea states. If you miss any of those points, then then people will not be comfortable and they'll look for excuses. They'll look for the perfect weather window, which of course is always next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean that's absolutely true. And so, if you're building this boat, and people buy from people, so it's kind of super important that um, it's super important that you trust the people you're working with but nonetheless when you are buying something where you know there isn't another one in the world it's not like an FPB where if you buy an FPB 64 there are 11 in the world and so there never will be a 12th but if there were you'd know have characteristics because there are literally hundreds of thousands of sea miles under those boats but say you're um, you're building this boat and there's one or two on the water or none on the water, what data would you absolutely insist on seeing 
as being really important before you commissioned a build? Sue, that's a, that's a really tough question and, 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 and a good one, obviously, because when you're, when you're <coughs> starting out from scratch, uh, it's a lot of money that you're putting on the table um, and you don't have the, you, it's particularly difficult if you don't have a chance to go to see an, another boat. So I, I'm not sure how I, how I would answer that for other people. In our case, uh, we've always built the, the first boat in a series for, for ourselves. Uh, well, well, look at Windhorse. I mean, you were that soldier. You and Linda were those soldiers. You um, started out, you knew the designer quite well, but um, what did you absolutely, um, what was really important? Because she was a whole new thing. You didn't know where the motorboats were going to work. You didn't even like them. Uh, you could say that Windhorse was a, was, was a huge risk for us because we hadn't done a boat like that. Uh, we certainly, had uh, several of our friends, we have uh, several good friends who are, who are uh, very talented designers, and they told us it wouldn't work. Um, the, the problem in, uh, the, the major problem that we face and that everybody else buying one of these boats is gonna face is how do, you, how do you put together a yacht which will recover from a capsize that has a, has a good uh, stability curve for that, that's comfortable in a seagoing form. It's, it's uh, common, and it's, it's easy in sailboats because you've got a keel, you've got a rig, you have high polar moments, et cetera. But when you have a powerboat, the, the way that uh, uh, most powerboats are done, with the exception of surf rescue craft, uh, they typically do not have stability uh, past about 60, 70 degrees. And on, for example, on passenger liners, on big ships, they have ballast tanks up high to reduce the stability because if the stability is too high, their motion is too quick. Uh, now, th that's that's the tricky part. How do you how do you de de design a hull shape uh, that uh, that both recovers from a capsize and is comfortable without a keel or mast? That was the the, uh, the, f the part of the equation with Windhorse that we were struggling with because we, as far as efficiency goes, I mean our power our sailboats uh, all powered uh, for more miles, much more efficiently and faster than any of the trawlers did. So that was easy. It was a comfort equation that was difficult. And we, we spent uh, almost a year uh, working uh, 20 hour, 18 to 20 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, looking at, at literally thousands of configurations. Uh, and I mean, Linda was, uh, you know, we work at home, Linda would, was bringing my meals to the office. Um, uh, it was a, a very stressful period uh, because we were, <clears throat> A, we're talking about a lot of money and B, people were saying this wasn't gonna work. We knew it. We knew the the, the propulsion part was easy. Uh, it was a motion equation. Well, I, rem I remember people saying that guy get dashes designing a motorboat. It's not going to work. I remember that. So the uh, all the ratios are different than than uh, 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 than normal motorboats, and that's why. Uh, if you have conventional ratios, you don't have the comfort. We met in two thousand and eight on a horrible morning raining, dull, in Birth and Lymington Marina. It was just uh, you and Linda on board the boat. Do you remember that? Do I remember a, a typical summer day in... <laughs> in England, yes. That trip was really a good example of what a, what a comfortable seaboat will do for you. Um, at the end of 2007, we didn't have a plan, and, and we've been, so what are we gonna do next year? Geez, let's go to Greenland. Uh, well, we were in Southern California. That seems like a rather long way away. But the reality is, it's, t it's 10 easy days to Panama. From Panama, it's four easy days to the Bahamas. From the Bahamas, it's three or four easy days, picking your weather, of course, to uh, 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 northeastern Canada. And then you have some time to work your way up through the Straits of Belle Isle. And, and uh, whatever time you says, if you're passing straight through, that's just a couple of days. And then you're three days from, from Greenland. I mean, it's so simple. And when you're in Greenland, you're, you're um, uh, uh, five days from Ireland. Um, so uh, we just made a spur of the moment decision. I think it's close to 10,000 miles. Um, so, um, and we, didn't, we, we, were, we were rested, we didn't feel rushed. We, the, the, that's where this average speed and, and the, is, is so important. If you can average 10 to 11 knots and in all conditions, that's enough speed that you can play the weather systems. And, and, and of course, you're averaging it in comfort. And, and, and so tell me, so when you launched um, Windhorse, 
you weren't sure with all your experience that this was going to work. So she went on the water and she worked so much better than you m imagined. What else could you have done to have made sure that she worked without real life tests? How do you actually know that that design with all the tests that have been carried out, when the boat launches, how do you know it's going to work? There's really no answer to that question. Uh, if you have not done this before, uh, then uh, you, you, you're taking a risk. Each design has been a little different, and, and so there's, um, we have, uh, we, 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 what we're doing, the last boats we did were entirely different than what we started out with then that's based on refining the concept. And but, but, but that, of course, is not taking the risk, because by this time you know what you're doing, because Windhorse has been the trailblazer, and then come the um, 64s, then comes um, Iceberg, then the 78, and, and so on and so on. So actually, when you're um, buying something that's part of a series, the, the designer gets it, but particularly a designer who hops on the boat and cruises her for 60,000 miles. The, the best example I can give you that is steering control. Uh, steering control is, 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 that's the holy grail. Uh, the, it's what, what controls your safety when you're, when you're uh, uh, jogging into, into a force nine or 10 uh, storm and they've got crossing sea states uh, and it's what allows you to surf at speed. And, and, and what, what dictates how fast you can surf or what conditions you can surf or can't surf in. And, and that's, uh, surfing is, there's, there's, there's so many variables involved because you have, uh, it, it's, not, it's not a single set of waves that, that what you're, what's the problem is when you have a crossing sea state. For example, the video we have up on, uh, on Cochise uh, in, uh, when we were doing sea trials, uh, heading up the Bay of Islands where we had this quickly rising gale and got up to blowing in the low 50s. Uh, and it was easy and the steering was no problem. It was great fun until we started closing with the, the, the Bay of Islands. And then we had the, it's an ironbound coast and so we had waves reflecting back from the from the foreshore at various angles. And the, you have this, 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 this chaotic sea state. There's no way to model that. You just have to go through it. And uh, uh, so, the, the variables involved in that are like the depth of your forefoot, the size of your rudders, uh, the, the shape of the hull and whether it develops lift or not. Uh, because if you can, if you can it, it's very difficult to have a, a bow which penetrates and a bow which lifts. That's a, so there's, there's sort of opposite end of the spectrum. But if you can get a bow that lifts at speed as the boat accelerates, you don't lose control. And uh, so, but you never know for sure. Uh, there's, there's always risk there. So. Uh, I mean, Cochise was, was, a, was a, a, a based on a progression of, of previous designs. We were really surprised to learn uh, that many of our owners were afraid to surf, uh, which just stunned us. And, and when we investigated that further, it was, well, uh, all the, if you come from a conventional powerboat design, you, you equate surfing with broaching, and broaching with, uh, out of, uh, it leads to sometimes very unhappy consequences. Um, so they were, they were afraid to let the boat surf, which is, which is actually the safest way to use our boats is to keep them at speed. Well, as we know, going fast is a lot more fun than going slowly. It's way more fun. <laughs> so a hell of a lot safer. And the other thing, other point I, I want, uh, we referred to touching this briefly before, but that's, that uh, the, and this is something we learned with, uh, with Beowulf uh, uh, as the, as the weather uh, routing software has gotten better and the weather modeling has gotten better, um, if, you, if you have sufficient boat speed, you can, you can make, the, uh, make the weather work for you and, and, and avoid the bad stuff. And you, if, again, it comes back to average boat speed. Uh, if, you can, if you can average, I mean, 10 knots, uh, and as you go up from there, it gets, uh, it gets uh, you, you get better and better control. When we took Beowulf from New Zealand to uh, uh, French Polynesia, uh, it was it was a wintertime passage. The weather is normally quite foul, and the the uh, the, the, <clears throat> the highs hadn't uh, dropped yet. So we were, again, one of these situations we were facing headwinds, um, and and then we had a high come through in the right position, and we said we're off, and we rode one single high pressure system 
all the way from, from Auckland, New Zealand to, to the Austral Islands, uh, 2,000 miles. The, before and after that, it was just chaotic and upwind, but that one system got us all the way there. Uh, that we, do the, we, we want to do the same thing on the power boats because you can, if you can pick your weather and stay with it, then it's more, it's, more, it's more comfortable, way more fun. In conclusion, all that is metal is not quite the same. And it's a lot more fun to go fast than it is to go slowly. And steering control is all. That's well put. Well, Steve, thank you so much. This podcast, the sort of the, the, the frequency of them has been far, far too long. And we'll try and do some more because um, it's always fab to speak to you. And um, every time we do that, um, we have quite a lot to do with um, FPB and the resales and stuff. I just remember again why it is that they are very cool boats. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sue. It's always a pleasure to talk boats with you.